Hi folks, here's the third part of our lecture on transport across the plasma membrane. In this video, I'm going to talk about active transport across the membrane. Um, active transport means that the cell has to provide the energy that's used to move molecules from one place to another. So remember Cells are surrounded by extracellular fluid. The cell membrane is semi-permeable, meaning that some things can cross, some things can't. We also describe it as being selectively permeable. Finally, cells are solutions of ions, sugars, amino acids dissolved in water as a solvent. And that's why the concentration of materials inside and outside is so critical. All right, so active transport requires the cell to use up some of its precious ATP, right? We refer to that as ATP hydrolysis. If you remember the ATP, ADP cycle from our cell lecture, you <clears throat> use ATP in a single molecule of water to generate ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. So we've split off a phosphate, um, a phosphate group, which is the P sub I. And that produces energy for work. Now the reverse reaction where we're taking ADP and inorganic phosphate and putting it back together into ATP and producing a water molecule in the process is a dehydration synthesis reaction and that requires the input of energy. All right, so whereas ATP hydrolysis is releasing energy, the dehydration synthesis of ADP and inorganic phosphate requires energy, and that energy comes from our food. All right, so there are two basic types of active transport. In the case of molecular pumps, it's usually very obvious when you look at diagrams that you're looking at active transport, and that's because ATP is part of what you're going to see in a diagram. The other kind of active transport that we're going to talk about is referred to as bulk transport. Bulk transport is used when there are much larger either quantities of material or much larger objects that need to be brought into or released from the cell. A lot of times in the diagrams for, for bulk transport, um, you don't see ATP being deployed because it's so much smaller than the other molecules that are being moved. And I'll, I'll point that out again. So we're going to start by talking about molecular pumps. One of the things with respect to molecular pumps is to just pay attention to the word pumps, right? A pump is something that requires energy to use. Um, and the reason you need energy with a pump to move, say, water up out of the ground is because you're moving water against a gravitational gradient, right? Every gravity pulls everything down. And when you want to pull water up out from underground, for whatever reason, you have to add energy to overcome the existing gradient. So the next thing to pay attention to, and this is particularly true in diagrams, um, is that molecules are being moved from where they're less concentrated to where they're more concentrated. And that's the reverse of what we see in passive transport. Right, so look for um, working against a concentration gradient 
like pushing a huge ball uphill, as in this image. Look for a membrane protein that is associated with ATP. Now, the, the pump that we always talk about because it's so important um, in animal biology and particularly in terms of the functioning of the nervous and muscular system is referred to as the sodium potassium pump. Sodium and potassium are both positively charged ions, but when this pump is running, over time, what that means is you end up with the cytoplasm of the cell having a slight negative charge compared to the fluid outside the cell. And that, in fact, is setting up an ionic concentration gradient. More about that next week. One of the really critical things to remember whenever we're talking about proteins but especially in this kind of case, is that when things, when other molecules bind to a protein, the protein will often change shape. And sometimes that shape change will open up pockets of the protein that weren't previously accessible. And that's the case here. That's what you're gonna see in this video. We also have Drake here acting as a sodium potassium pump because why not no or shape changes that occur as the sodium potassium pump is running so notice we've got ATP down here right and we have um, green sodium ions we've got three bound that leads to a shape change which causes the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Notice that the inorganic phosphate is still attached here. Then we have another shape change, which opens the top of the protein toward the extracellular space. At the same time, that makes the binding pockets for potassium, which is K, according to the periodic table, it makes those binding pockets more attractive to the potassium on the outside of the cell. The potassium ions bind, that leads to a shape change again, and then eventually the inorganic phosphate is released and the pot two potassium ions are ejected into the cytosol. So why do molecular pumps matter? Well, I mentioned the function of the nervous system and muscular system, but it's also the case that this process is important in absorption of nutrients. So when we look at this image, the term lumen means the inside of a hollow organ. So the lumen of the small intestine is the empty space inside the small intestine that's filled with digesting food. When you have glucose at lower concentrations in the lumen of the intestine compared to its presence inside cells of the small intestine, in order to get it into the body, which is right when it's in the small intestine, it's um, until it um, crosses this barrier of cells shown in blue here, it's not technically inside the body. So to get that glucose into the body, you have to use active transport. You have to use a glucose pump. If then you have higher still levels in the bloodstream, 
you're going to have to use active transport again. So sometimes glucose is an interesting molecule because, um, as you know, it's really important for aerobic cellular respiration. Um, it's many cells' preferred fuel type, and some cells, such as neurons, uh, just don't want anything to do with anything but glucose. So it's really important that this get inside our bodies when it's available. That's not a problem at all if the levels of glucose in the lumen of the intestine are higher than they are inside the intestinal cells. Then you can use facilitated diffusion, right, which is a passive transport mechanism. But when there's less glucose in the lumen of the intestine, you have to be able to switch. All right, on to bulk transport. So the first kind of bulk transport we're going to talk about is called endocytosis. So endo means inner or inside, cyto means cell, and osis means condition. So it's the condition of bringing materials into the cell. As you can see in this little GIF, what happens is that the, in general, the plasma membrane surrounds either large molecules um, and, and extracellular fluid um, or perhaps a bacterium and then that membrane pinches off internally and forms a vesicle. Now there are two different kinds of and endocytosis, just like there are two different ways of getting food into your digestive tract, or nutrients, I should say. You can either eat or you can drink. Same thing's true for cells. So phago means eating, so it's the condition of cell eating. Pino is drinking, so it's the condition of cell drinking. As you can see in this little animation, with phagocytosis, the cell membrane actually sort of reaches out and forms these uh, um, blob-like almost arms that come around and engulf a particle, um, such as a bacterium or a virus, for example. With pinocytosis, you're taking in molecules and fluid. And in that case, the membrane sort of dips down and then the two sides pull together and you end up with a vesicle on the inside. Whereas with phagocytosis, it's more like the arms reach out and then you end up eventually with the bacterium or the virus inside of a, a phospholipid bilayer vesicle. So why does endocytosis matter? Well, we've already talked about white blood cells um, being capable of destroying bacteria um, by engulfing the bacterium and then fusing with the lysosome, which is full of hydrolytic enzymes. Um, but in a friendlier, on a friendlier note, it's also how the digestive systems of babies absorb antibodies that are present in their mom's breast milk. And that's what we're seeing in this image. So you can see it's, we can tell it's pinocytosis because we've got the, the sort of dipping in um, and we've got their antibodies here, and then you end up with the antibodies inside this phospholipid bilayer, which is then inside the intestinal cell. So last but not least, we have exocytosis. In exocytosis, you have a vesicle full of material. Perhaps it is a hormone steroid hormone or a protein hormone like insulin um, or perhaps it's um, 
molecules called neurotransmitters that allow nerve cells to communicate with one another. In either case, the vesicle is towed to the plasma membrane, right? Both are made of phospholipid bilayers. When the phospholipid bilayer of the vesicle touches the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane, the two fuse together. And the vesicle phospholipids end up in the plasma membrane of the cell. I forgot to give you guys the word dissection here. So exo, as you might guess, refers to exit or kicking out. Then we've got cell condition. So exit the cell condition. Why does exocytosis matter? Well, as I said, it's the way that um, nerve cells, which are called neurons, communicate with one another and with muscles. It's also how hormones are released into the bloodstream in some cases. All right, so just to sort of put all of this together, we've got passive transport as a means of moving things across the cell membrane. And first we talked about diffusion, which occurs when you have small nonpolar molecules, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide gas, steroids, osmosis, which is the movement of water from areas that are hypotonic to areas that are hypertonic. Finally, with passive transport, we have facilitated transport or facilitated diffusion. And that can be any molecule that there is a channel or a pore protein built for that's inserted into the membrane. What powers passive transport? The existence of a concentration gradient. Whenever you have areas where matter is more concentrated, it will move from there to where it's less concentrated, unless there's something that prevents that. Active transport involves the use of cellular energy, right? So essentially ATP hydrolysis. And we talked about molecular pumps, which can be used to move sodium and potassium, or glucose, or, or any number of other molecules. Next, we talked about bulk transport, two basic categories, endocytosis, which is used to move material into the cell, exocytosis, which moves material out of the cell. Endocytosis, there are two kinds. There's cell eating, which is phagocytosis, and is used to engulf things like uh, viruses and bacteria that are fairly large. Pinocytosis, or cell drinking, which is used to take in smaller molecules and fluids. Finally, I thought I would share uh, this very old animation with you. As you can tell, it's really pixelated. But I think it really makes the point that passive transport makes use of existing gradients. In this metaphor, the gradient that is present is a gravitational gradient represented by the slope of the hill that either the cement block is meant to slide down, right? So if the hill is steep enough, that cement block is gonna slide regardless of how heavy it is. Next, we've got facilitated diffusion, right? And the facilitation, the protein pores are represented by the wheels in this image, right? So that can allow diffusion to happen a lot more rapidly. We don't have osmosis in this particular image, but <clears throat> you can imagine um, when osmosis occurs through specialized protein pores that are called aquaporins, 
it's facilitated diffusion and the small amount of water that can get through the cell membrane on its own that occurs by diffusion. Then finally, we have active transport represented by a motorized vehicle driving against the gravitational gradient, right? So it's got wheels, meaning in this analogy, you need a, a protein that's selective for whatever's being pumped. You also need an engine. So the engine is equivalent to a pump. All right, that's it. Next week, we will be jumping into the nervous system.